church this morning, amen. Let's stand and join in. Excellent song, and uh, no doubt we're thankful for the resurrection. Changes everything. Uh, it's really what puts it all into perspective for us here as believers. Good to have you, and I welcome those who've joined us online. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for those uh, opportunities we've got to be able to gather once again, and I thank you for the truths of the song uh, that you live. Uh, what a wonderful truth that you live within our hearts. What a wonderful truth that you're working through us. Lord, I pray you would help us to be faithful. I ask you to challenge us as we study your word this morning. Draw us closer to you. I pray that when we leave here, uh, we would be more like you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You go ahead and be seated, right? Our next song will be number 44 in our hymn books, Be Thou Exalted.
Number of things coming up this Friday, 9.30, we'll have a time of prayer. Ladies, uh, we'll have a time with Amy. Men, Cecil will be here, and if you're interested in being here at 9.30, uh, that'll be a great time, and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, it's really just a time to gather together and pour out our hearts before the Lord, and so that'll be this Friday. Saturday will be the blood drive. That begins at right and uh, if you are willing to be a part of that sign up and we've got several who are not uh, in my knowledge anyway connected with the church uh, maybe listen to online but we've got several outsiders that are already scheduled up and uh, so if you're willing to be a part of that sign up on the online form it's easiest for us if you are unwilling to do that there's a paper form and we'll be glad to enter the information for you as well and then uh, Wednesday the 10th will be the Wednesday night meal Thursday the 11th, ladies will have a Bible study uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening. I would appreciate the prayers Friday the 12th. I will be leaving for Wyoming again and uh, returning out there, and so we would appreciate prayers regarding that project. Number 63, Glory to His Name. Special anniversary we want to recognize this morning. Tomorrow, August the 1st, Pastor and Miss Amy will have been married for probably to Dan. Two wonderful seen years. What? <laughs> <laughs> Two wonderful years. <laughs> How many years has it been? 24 years. Amen. Jacqueline and I are halfway there. <laughs> We've been married for 12, so we're halfway there. If the two of you can make it, Jacqueline, baby, you and I can make it. <laughs> Amen. I'm just teasing this morning. Let's sing happy anniversary to Pastor and his wife. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. One day I'm going to get that right. Today's not going to be the day. 
Let's stand for our final song this morning. We'll sing 417 and as well with my son. Seated the day when my faith shall be sight. What a thought. We shall see him as he is, according to 1 John chapter 3. And uh, man, that is really quite an incredible thought. Let's go to John chapter number 15 this morning. As you're turning to that, my wife says she's been married to me for two wonderful years. There's a background to that that's only fair for me to explain. We were in some store somewhere, and uh, I don't even know how we got onto the topic of how long we had been married, uh, but in, that, in answering that question, I said, two wonderful years, and my, <laughs> my wife looked at me and said, we've been married longer than that, and I said, that's not what I said. That was when I got slapped, and I said, but it was the last two that were so wonderful, and uh, so what goes around comes around, and uh, anyway, John chapter 15 uh, in John 15, Jesus described in the first eight verses a unique relationship that existed. 
between himself and his disciples and then by extension to all subsequent believers. Jesus said, I am the vine, the true vine, and my father is the husband. And this was an illustration that was very familiar to the Jew, a vine and a vineyard. Land of Palestine was a land that was well known for its abundance of vineyards. And so Jesus' statement here in this text was one in which they could all very easily and readily relate. In this expression, Jesus said, I am the true vine. It was a statement that was intended to contrast Israel with whom God frequently described as a vine that had been delivered from Egypt and planted in the land of Palestine. But unfortunately, Israel failed to produce the fruit that God had intended. Instead, they were a wild vine whom God the Father had to judge. In contrast then, Jesus declares himself to be the authentic vine, the true vine that lived in perfect obedience to the Father. In addition, Jesus also stated that my Father is the husbandman or the farmer. The job of the farmer or the one who tended the vine was a job that was of extreme importance. He was the man who was responsible for both the quality as well as the quantity of the fruit. So to enable the vine to achieve its maximum potential, this individual had to exercise discernment when it came to the care of the branches. He would carefully inspect all the various shoots from the vine, and in doing so, he was looking for one thing, signs of life. Is there life in this branch? You might see a little green sprig come up. There's life. There's not much, but there's something. <laughs> okay. If the branch had no life to it, it was removed, it was gathered, and it was ultimately burned. But on the other hand, the branches that had the life were pruned in order to produce greater quantity and greater quality of fruit. By applying this then to his disciples, Jesus was stating that these disciples derived their life from Jesus. It's where eternal life truly is found. And if you've not placed your trust in him, you don't have eternal life today. Branches that bore no fruit were nothing more than empty professions illustrated perfectly by a man by the name of Judas Iscariot. But on the other hand, branches that were truly connected to the vine were pruned in order to produce more fruit. If you are a believer today, you are going to produce fruit. People are going to see evidence in your life that your salvation is a genuine salvation. Your life has been transformed. We're not saying that you need to be perfect, but there's evidence that faith has truly changed your life, that Jesus Christ has changed who you are. That's the life. And what he will do is he will begin to prune and cut away those things that are going to hinder the growth. The pruning process is a painful process, but it is a very beneficial process. Now, inasmuch as it is God the Father who is responsible for the care of the vine, then you and I can rest assured that the care of the vine is consistent with his nature because God cannot do something that is inconsistent to his nature and still be God. And we examined this last week. Now, there are different ideas and interpretations regarding the sense of the phrase, abide in me. To me, it seems best to understand the phrase as establishing the importance of the believer in developing and maintaining a close re relationship and fellowship with the Lord. So the fruit that is produced is going to be ultimately produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of the Father, and it is going to be enhanced by the work of the Father. He's going to prune and cut away those things in our lives that should not be there. But it is never the responsibility of the branch to produce the fruit. That is always the responsibility of the vine. You cannot live the Christian life in your own strength. If you try to do so, you are going to fail miserably. The analogy of the vine does not continue per se beyond verse 8. However, the theme of abiding continues to be developed. 
And so the concept then of abiding as maintaining this close fellowship with the Lord is going to be developed in different aspects, but we will see a consistent theme, and it is that of maintaining fellowship. Notice, and I've got this on your handout as well, believers must determine to constantly remain in close fellowship with God to display a life that abides in Him. That's the essence of what we're going to say this morning. Now the question then is, what does that kind of a life look like? Well, there are three evidences that we are going to note this morning. The first evidence of a life of abiding in Him is abiding love. Notice our text, John chapter number 15. Let's begin the reading, verse number 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might remain in you, or that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now, all throughout that text, you find the word abide, continue, and remain. They're all the same word, and they're all the exact same word that was used back in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, where Jesus said to abide in me. Fruit that remains. What does this look like? Well, first of all, abiding love. Now, as I've mentioned on a number of occasions, throughout this farewell discourse that is really beginning towards the end of John 13 and continuing through 16, Jesus elaborates on three important relationships. There is, first and foremost, their relationship with God. Inasmuch as the relationship with God is the relationship from which all other relationships flow, success in the other two relationships Demands that you be right in the relationship with God. Restate a little differently. If your fellowship with God is not right, or I'm sorry, if your relationship with God is not right, then I can assure you that your relationship with others is not going to be right. I'll also say that if your relationship with others is not right, your relationship with God cannot be right. If you allow bitterness and offenses to cause divisions, those things have to be corrected in order for you to have a right relationship with God. Jesus also knew that these disciples needed to not only understand the importance of their relationship with God, but also the importance of their relationship with the world. To this point, Jesus, they have observed Jesus being questioned and even rejected, but they were about to witness something that they would never have imagined, I think, taking place in their lifetime. The sufferings that Jesus endured, the death and the, the crucifixion, the uh, eventual resurrection, all of that, they would never have imagined how full of hatred the world could be. Jesus had to de describe what the relationship would be like for the world because they would soon be misfacing that very same mistreatment. And knowing this, Jesus explains in this section of Scripture what their relationship to the world is going to be like. But it's the third relationship that really is more the focus of our text, and that is their relationship to each other. It was vital that these disciples maintain a relationship with other, with each other that would actually produce evidence that says we truly belong to Jesus. When Jesus first began to address the disciples, this was what he stated in John chapter 13. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. 
Once again, Jesus affirmed that the standard by which they were to love one another was the same standard by which he loved them. That's the sense in which Jesus says this is a new command. It's not new in the sense of loving one another because that was even found in the Old Testament. Loving fellow believers as Christ loved is a powerful testimony to others that indicates proof of genuine discipleship. Do you understand that people are watching you and they are watching us corporately? They look to see how you handle things individual and they look to see how we handle things collectively as a group. When we abide in a walk where we are truly loving one another, it gives evidence that we are truly committed followers of Jesus Christ. There ought to be something different about his disciples. And when we allow division and factions and strife to come into this, it gives evidence to a world that, hey, wait a minute, things are not right. What kind of transformation has actually happened when their home sounds worse than mine sounds? What is the testimony of a church that is known for very bitter groups of opposition that just are constantly fighting with each other? Either fix it or close the doors. Because it's a hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, people will just be content to sit there and argue and bicker and fight over color of carpet and color of paint. And the lists go on and on and on and on. And what are we doing to the cause of Jesus Christ? We are hindering it significantly in doing so. When we consider this evidence of abiding love, I want you to note, first of all, a divine standard. Once again, Jesus makes this statement in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Here is a comparison that is being made. By making this statement, Jesus compares the love that he has received from the Father to the love that he has extended to the disciples. Jesus is directing, I think, once again, that the connection, the attention to the unity that existed between the Father and the Son. This love here is the love that we have often described as the agape love. That The Greek term is the word agape. It's a, a love that is the, uh, the highest form of love. We gave two qualities to it recently uh, when we said that it was sacrificial and intentional. And you think of the love that God the Father had to God the Son. It was a perfect love. It was an unending love. And we could go on and describe it in many other terms. But it was that same love that God the Father sent to Jesus that Jesus then sent outwardly to his disciples. Here was a group of individuals who were far from perfect, but the love that Jesus had for them never diminished and it never ceased. Now, they repeatedly failed, but Jesus loved them, and he did so with an absolutely perfect love. John chapter 13, verse 1, began stating this way, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, believers today can rest assured that Jesus loves them to the same degree and in the same way. Understand this morning that God's love for you is unfailing and it is unconditional. You do nothing to earn his love and you can do nothing to lose his love. A person who has placed his trust in Jesus Christ can never at any point exist outside of his love. Now, if you've gone through some hard times, you maybe say, well, I don't feel loved. The issue is in what your perception of that love is, not the reality of it. You don't ever exist in a realm or sphere outside of God's love regardless of what you feel and regardless of what you may do. Paul described it this way in Romans chapter 8. 
He said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. In making this statement, Jesus is, or I'm sorry, Paul is taking, for the most part, extremes, okay? Height and depth, things present, things to come, uh, spiritual beings, things here on this earth, okay? By using these extremes, he then states, okay, implied within that, if, if this extreme can't and if this extreme can't, then anything in between can't. So I am a recipient of, of this love, just as these disciples were. Number two, I'd like you to note, not only the divine standard, but a divine command. He continues in verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. The love that I have received as the love that I have extended, here's the command, continue ye in my love. The word continue is the same word abide or remain. Here the tense is going to suggest there's an urgency. This is something that needs to be undertaken at once. So you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now you need to be a committed follower of him. Okay. And there's a lot of growth and a lot of conversation that we can go down that line and we're not going to this morning. However... Here's the statement. You have been the recipient of God's divine love through Jesus Christ. Now you are instructed here in this text, abide in my love. You continue in my love. Now we're going to give a clarification in verse 10 because I probably would imagine that your natural question is, how does this happen? And I'll share that here in a moment. But let me give you a clarification before I do so. Jesus is not in any way suggesting that it is possible for a person to step outside the boundaries of God's love. can't do that if you are the recipient of it. We've already established this in Romans chapter number 8. So then the question naturally is how does a believer continue in his love? Well, the answer that is to this question is seen for us in verse 10, and that leads us to a third point in our outline, a divine condition. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. So continue in my love, remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. So the essence of this condition makes no assertion as to whether or not the commands are going to be kept. What we're going to say is this, you personally are responsible for whether or not you're going to keep these commands. This word keep suggests the idea of persistent obedience. What are we persistently obeying? It's God's commandments. That's what's being emphasized. So by making this statement in this condition, if ye shall keep or if ye keep my commandments, here's a condition. We cannot say whether or not it's going to take place because it's actually up to the individual. So you take the perspective, this is God's instruction, now how am I, as a believer, going to respond to that? One of the foundational principles to understand regarding your personal walk with the Lord is that it is just that, personal. <laughs> it is predicated upon what you individually determined to do as it relates to God's commandments. We read of them all the time. We read of things that we're to do. We read of things we're not to do. We read of things we're to say, not to say. Attitudes we're to have. Attitudes we're not to have. Mindsets of trust versus a mindset of worry. The lists go on and on and on. There are many, many commands all throughout the word of God. I cannot force you to do so, but you personally are responsible for how you are going to respond to those commandments. You can choose to obey them. You can choose to disregard them, but the decision ultimately is yours. Now, in as much as the decision is yours, then we would also have to say that you are personally accountable for how you respond to it. God has given us his word. So a person who chooses to disregard God's commandments cannot blame others for his problems. 
He cannot blame the difficulties of life and suggest, well, it's just too hard for me to do what God says. Well, you don't know how wicked the culture is. You can't blame culture either. You see, the decision is you personally responsible for whatever you are going to do with the teaching of the Word of God. So therefore, you are the one that is responsible for the degree of your spiritual maturity. You can't blame everyone else. And until you embrace your own personal responsibility to this, you're probably not going to advance very far in your Christian life. The reality of our personal accountability, I would suggest before God, is seldom considered. As believers, we all will one day stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. It's there that our works are going to be judged, not our sin. Our sin has already been judged. Okay? No believer, however, is exempt from this judgment. And no work is exempt from this judgment. As a believer, you are one day going to stand before God and give an account of things. This is what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Some of the works are described in that passage as gold, silver, and precious stones. When you put fire to those things, they are refined and purified. Others are wood, hay, and stubble. When you put fire to those works, they are consumed, and there is nothing left. The text is very clear that no person is exempt from this, no believer is exempt from this. This is not the judgment with unbelievers. That's the great white throne judgment later on in Revelation 20. No believer is present there. No unbeliever is present here. Every man's work, every one of us, and every work will be put to the fire. Poof. I'm not sure we think about that well. Because that ought to make a difference as to how we respond to the commandments in the Word of God. Amen. Choose wisely how you respond to God's instruction. Finally, I'd like you to note in this text a divine assurance. If ye keep my commandments... Ye shall abide in my love. You will remain, you will continue in my love. Again, we're not suggesting from this that a person who disobeys God's instruction is now no longer an object of God's love. The passage is telling us that the individual who obeys God's instruction is remaining in close fellowship with God. So he is, we might say, experiencing the depth of God's love. He is the beneficiary of God's love. So, an obedient believer is going to be a growing believer. We're not, again, don't hold the standard of perfection. The, the tendency to say, okay, man, i got so far to go. Welcome to the Christian life. Okay? Everybody who is a part of the Christian life, if they are honest, will say, I've got a long way to go. Uh, I, I'm not sure at times if I'm even going forward, it feels like I may take two steps forward in my Christian walk and then I find I went three back, okay? And you probably feel that same way, all right? The sensitivity behind that is a good thing. Uh, being content to go three back is not, okay? But the sensitivity behind that is, is no doubt a good thing. But an obedient believer is going to be a growing believer. One of the things in which he is going to grow is his understanding of the degree of God's love. Paul makes a prayer in Ephesians 3. I'll bring the verses up here in just a little bit. But in this passage, he prays for these believers. And the Bible says, I bow my knees in prayer. And he prays for several things. He prays that they would, first of all, be inwardly strengthened by the Holy Spirit. 
He prayed that they would be rooted and grounded in love. And then he makes this statement in Ephesians 3 verse 18. That ye may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know, and let me add by experience personally, the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now when Paul writes this to these individuals in the city of Ephesus, was he writing to believers or unbelievers? He was writing to believers. It suggests then to me that the implication is that a believer can continue to grow and actually come to know in an even greater level by his own personal experience the unfathomable depth of God's love. I'm not saying that you're going to be able to comprehend it completely. But you can certainly grow in it. And when you grow in your understanding of God's love, you will grow in your desire to obey Him. If it is possible for a believer to come to a greater understanding of God's love, it would also then seem logical that a believer may never experience that if he is not growing in his walk with the Lord. So a believer who disregards God's commandments is not going to remain in his love. In other words, he's not going to have that intimate connection with God's love. It's not that he is outside of God's love. He doesn't have the connection of that love. He'll still continue to be a child of God, but he is not going to come to know by personal experience the depth of God's love. Those of you who have had children would probably understand this by somewhat of a less than ideal illustration, I guess. A child who, in a normal home, Okay, I understand that our homes today are, uh, let me redefine this. In God's definition of a normal home, not in culture's definition of a normal home, because those are two different norms. In God's definition of a normal home, the parents love the children. Most children do not understand the depth to which that parent loves that child. Uh, you didn't growing up, uh, probably if you were a good child, after you had children, you thanked your mom and dad for what they put up with. <laughs> you understood differently their love for you. When a child persists in rebellion, He is still loved by that parent. Amen. But that child doesn't really perceive that. All that child perceives is mom and dad say no, 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 no to everything. Meanwhile, the parent's perception is that child is going to do whatever they want to do. And the last thing I'm going to do is give them permission to do anything. If they continue on this path, they're going to have to ask me for permission to breathe. <laughs> it's, it, they don't sense that love. Why? Because just the constant tension that's there. If I could use that somewhat not so refined illustration, I think it describes for us to a degree what Jesus is saying here. It's not that you cease to become my child. But you're not growing in my love. You're not coming to know by experience the depth of love that I have for you. You're just mad because I said no. Or you're just mad because I took that away. The believer who is walking close with God will naturally respond in obedience to God and he will come to a greater understanding of God's love. That understanding 
is what shapes our attitude when it comes to the difficulties and the hardships that God's permit, God permits in my life. When I'm close with him, and I'm not saying these things are easy because we all know they're not, but when I am close with him, I have a much greater understanding of his love for me. And so when he permits these hardships and difficulties into my life, I understand that God is doing so out of his love. And yes, it's challenging. So the first evidence of a life that is abiding in him is abiding love. Secondly, a second evidence is that of abiding joy. Notice verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that your joy or that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, Jesus is addressing these disciples. Does Jesus know what is about to transpire? Yes. He knows that Judas Iscariot has departed and is plotting with the religious leaders to betray him and turn him over to be arrested. Jesus knew that he would suffer, that he would be killed, that he would be raised the third day. He taught his disciples this in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. While Jesus knew what he was going to experience, his disciples did not. Jesus knew that he would, the disciples rather, would scatter as sheep when the shepherd was smitten. He knew they would flee in sorrow. He knew they would hide in fear. He knew that the message that he was about to depart from them and go to a place where they were unable to follow him was a troubling message for them to hear. He knew they misunderstood the reason for his coming by concluding that it was to set up this earthly kingdom and free them from the tyranny of Rome. So then why was he saying all this stuff? Was he saying all these things to rob them of their joy? He was actually saying these things. His message was intended to encourage them with the reality of abiding joy. So that leads us now to two elements regarding the nature of this message. What kind of message was it? Number one, it was an authoritative message. These things have I spoken unto you. Here they are overcome with a range of emotions and confusions. And Jesus says, let me remind you of what I have said. Now the content of these things probably is referring here to the content of what he stated most recently in this farewell discourse. But what Jesus was doing is directing their attention to the content of the message that Jesus had spoken to them. Because it was that focus that was necessary for them to experience this joy. We cannot allow our minds at any time to ignore the teaching of the Word of God, especially when we are facing difficulties. How prone we are to experience how Satan will subtly and quickly direct our attention away from what God has said to many things, including how we feel and what our perception of things is or what others have said. And we have allowed our minds to subtly be taken off the content of what has God said. These things have I spoken unto you, and I have done so that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. But you have to keep your focus on the content of what he has said, not on what you feel, not on what you perceive everything to be, and not of what everyone has told you. Because when you allow your mind to be taken off of the content of what God has said, you will inevitably lose your joy. Joy cannot exist if we fail to consciously regard God's truth. It was an authoritative message. But secondly, it was a purposeful message. Two reasons as to why he stated these things, none of which were to make them miserable. I'd stated these things for two reasons, in order that my joy might remain in you. By now, hopefully, you figured out remain, continue, and abide are all the same word. If not, you haven't listened for two weeks. Okay? 
Uh, it wouldn't be too much of a chewing, but it would be a pretty good little chewing, all right? So hopefully you figured this out. Jesus has spoken these things in order that his joy would continue in them. Do you realize as a believer that it is possible for you to experience God's divine joy regardless of the circumstances you're facing? By continuing to abide in Him, they would be obeying Him and thereby they would experience His joy regardless of circumstances. I will say, however, that the instruction comes or, the, or this provision comes for us after the instruction on obedience. Biblical joy follows, only follows obedience. Disobedience may produce a temporal happiness or whatever, but that emotion is going to quickly flee. Biblical joy only comes when you obey God's instruction. God says don't, therefore don't. God says do, therefore do. It's not complicated. We've complicated it, but it really is not. Biblical joy, I would say, only abides to those, remains to those who abide in the vine. Those who are maintaining a close fellowship with the Lord. I'm amazed when I've heard of various trials that individuals are going through, yet they still have the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. How does that happen? Because they've got a close walk with the Lord. Now, when a person is derailed from that, bitterness, grumpiness, discontentment, anger, all the emotions that are opposite of joy begin to take place. This is not something that is independent of circumstances because Jesus knew everything that they would encounter. Yet he still desired and gave them this instruction in order that his joy might remain in them, regardless of what they would experience. Galatians 5 indicates that this is a product of the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit that is produced by the Holy Spirit. My joy might remain in you. And secondly, he says, I, I did this that your joy might be full. That my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. The idea is that your joy might be holding as much as it can hold. I know some Christians who have a reservoir that needs some more joy added to it. They're what we call grumpy. All the time. Everything's grumpy. The last time they smiled was 30 years ago, and when they did, their face cracked. They're not smiling now. They might not be smiling for what I'm saying either. It's all right. That your joy might be able to hold as much as it can hold. Can you imagine what we would look like as believers if that was how we portrayed Christianity to the world? Who wants to be a Christian when you lose everything and every day hurts? Well, sign me up. I just go to a job and make money and have a decent living. Why would I want yours? I can actually go home and be happy at night. I don't want anything you've got. And if this is our mindset towards what God has allowed, we are not abiding in the vine as we ought to be abiding in the vine. Because when we do so, there are certain evidences that say this person has a close walk with the Lord. And one of those evidences, there is going to be abiding joy. It's a joy that simply finds doing God's will as his greatest desire. And that kind of a joy can remain regardless of the circumstances that you may face. The final evidence of a life that is abiding in him is that of abiding fruit. Jesus made it clear in John 15, 1 through 8, that the believer in him, who or the believer who abides in him, will produce much fruit and thereby will bring glory to God. In other words, that fruit is going to display itself outwardly by visible character traits that people are going to be able to observe. We're not. Yes, the work is done inwardly, but that work comes out. Amen. Okay? One of those traits that is produced by the Holy Spirit is that of love. That's actually what he directs our attention to beginning in verse 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another 
as I have loved you. Let's note from verse number 12 that there is a divine expectation. Once again, Jesus reiterates how they were to love each other. He said in verse 9, continue ye in my love. Now he says in verse 12, love one another. This is my commandment. This is an expectation. This is something that God says, I expect this to happen. Do you know we often view this as a recommendation or something that is optional? Well, if I want things to go well, then I need to love people. No, you need to love people because that's what God said to do. Well, that person, that believer there, that person's really hard to love. God bless those people. They just help you fulfill this command. Now, on the other side of that, don't be one of those. <laughs> okay? But believers have to understand that a love for one another, and we're speaking now in the corporate realm in believers, not just this, it's not a, it doesn't extend in the same sense to unbelievers. It does not mean that we don't love unbelievers. That's not what I'm saying. But the sacrificial love that is extended to one another is a unique thing that is to exist among Christians. So if we are not in a right relationship with other believers, we cannot once again be right in a, our relationship with God. Love one another as I have loved you. Very similar to what was already stated in John chapter 13 and verse 33 where he indicated that it was a new command. Once again, the premise was new in the sense that it was as I have loved you. I want you to see the progression of this text though to what we've already studied. Jesus said, I am the recipient of my love, of God the Father's love and I have extended that love to you. As an individual who has been loved by the Father, the Son's sole delight was doing the will of the Father. Now that love has been extended to us. Our sole desire should be on maintaining a close relationship with Him in order that others may see our fruit. As I have loved you, love one another. Now, obviously, the standard cannot be perfectly attained. But I think it illustrates for us that it needs to be constantly growing. The love that Jesus Christ had to these disciples was perfect. We cannot love perfectly. But we sure can try. And we need to constantly be growing. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Okay, we won't talk about that verse anymore, right? Immediately, there's a sense of conviction of, wow, I need to constantly be doing better with this. It's the same thing that is stated here. Cannot do it in your own strength. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 tells us this, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Understand what this verse is saying. The Holy Spirit resides in us, and it is God's love that is shed abroad or literally poured out by means of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. How is it poured out? Through us. Love one another. So the biblical principle, God loved the Son, the Son loved the disciples, the disciples are now to love one another. This is the progression that is going on. Not only do we note this expectation, but secondly, I'd like you to note a sacrificial expression, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The love of which we are speaking is not a love that can be inwardly and selfishly contained. It is going to demonstrate itself. Biblical love always is selfless and always is beneficial. There is no greater expression of love. The greatest expression of love is when a man lays down his life for his friends. Now, friendship in this culture was very important. It could exist on a number of levels. It could exist from a, a political alliance in which an individual was a friend to a ruler. Sometimes it was between individuals who were not equal. So a wealthy person may 
uh, take on someone who is a friend that does not have as much. He's less well off and there's this unequal sense. And it may be a friendship that exists between two individuals who are of equal status. And when that's the case, confidences would be shared. Possessions may even be shared. And in some extreme cases, a person may, according to our text, give up his life for his friend. Now, I don't want to remove this verse from its primary context because Jesus is about to call them friends and illustrate for us, I'm about to give my life for you. But before I go there, let me talk about this heroic concept of laying down my life for somebody. Because we often, oh yeah, yeah, I'd gladly, I, yeah, I'd, I'd take getting run over by the bus. Probably shouldn't talk about that with a blood drive bus coming. Uh, but anyway, we, we talk about all of the, this heroic aspect. But let me ask you, how many small things do we never do that demonstrate love? Love is often not measured in great deeds. Love is often measured more in terms of the small acts of kindness that may even go unnoticed. It may be by you spending time just listening to someone who is grieving. Love may be expressed in a note that says, I'm praying for you. Love is expressed in appreciation that is expressed, not just felt. Well, I am thankful. Then say it. Tell somebody thank you for doing something that was kind. If a person doesn't express his love in the less significant details of life, he's never going to express it in the greater, de in the greater degree. You'll never give up your life for someone for whom you can't say thank you to. It's not going to happen. You're never going to give up your life if you can't just spend five minutes listening. You won't give your life for someone for whom you can't simply send a note that says, hey, I just wanted to let you know I'm praying for you today. Jesus thirdly describes an intimate friendship, verses 14 through 16. He says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. The term describes someone who's well known, someone who's loved and trusted. It's a relationship that exists between individuals and it is contrasted with the position of a servant. But there are three things about this intimate friendship. Number one, it's evidenced by obedience. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Obedience is the link that identifies them as true disciples. Therefore, obedience is the link that identifies them as friends. Now, Jesus is not suggesting in this that they have to do certain things to earn this friendship. What he is saying is that obedience to my commands is going to reveal that you are my friends. It's evidenced by obedience. Number two, it's revealed in fellowship. Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants. That word henceforth is not one we necessarily use a whole lot today. Uh, but it expresses the idea of something that is not going to continue from this point. From this point, Jesus says, I'm not calling you servants. Now, in our culture, we don't necessarily understand the connotation of this, but a servant here was a bond slave, one who had no rights of his own. His will was solely wrapped up in the will of his master. The reason that Jesus did not want to call them servants is stated for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. The servant is unable to perceive whatever his master is doing. For the most part, the actions of a master are largely unknown to the servant. The master does not say, hey, here's my schedule, what do you think? This is what I'm planning on doing today. I may be here at such and such a time. I may... He's just gone. The servant doesn't know all of those things. There's a... I guess maybe we would say that the phrase today, a professional relationship that would exist, kind of like a boss. <laughs> the employee, where's the boss? I don't know. Boss went somewhere. Bosses have that right. That's why they're bosses. Okay? You don't know everything that the boss is doing. You don't have to know everything, incidentally. <laughs> All that the servant knows is whatever the master deems fit to tell him. 
instead of calling them servants, Jesus says, but I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Everything that I have heard, I have not concealed this, these things. I've made all of this information known to you. I want you to think about how he's handled these disciples. He's about to depart from them. He's not hidden any of this. Everything that he's taught them throughout his whole earthly ministry, none of it was hidden. It wasn't a servant-master relationship. From this point forward, he says, I'm going to call you friends. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends. I'm going to lay down my life for you. It's a, an intimate fellowship. Number three, I want you to note that it was initiated by God. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You didn't select me. I selected you. Sovereign choice that God had to exercise. I chose you as my disciples. And I not only chose you, but I also, according to our text, ordained you. Or uh, we would typically say appointed. Um, it's interesting, the same word, although the sense of it's a little bit different. But it's the same word that was translated lay down back in verse 13. I am appointing you for something. I'm not appointing you, though, for prestige. I'm appointing you for specific tasks. I have appointed you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. That you would go and produce fruit, and I am appointing you that your fruit might remain. Any time we speak of salvation understand that it's always an act of God that has been initiated by him or an act of grace that's been initiated by God if God didn't do the initiation of this mankind would be hopelessly lost God initiated it. but it is also this act of grace that necessitates that we go on and we give an outward demonstration of the reality God saved you for a specific reason God saved you so that you would go and you would bear lasting or abiding fruit. And it can only happen as you abide in the vine. We've already alluded to the prayer life back in verse 7 last week, but it's also alluded to again. That for all things, I'm sorry, verse 16, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. That does not mean that you can pray for the big Powerball lottery ticket, and God's now obligated to give that to you. That's not what this is stating. A person who is close with God, who is in fellowship with God, is in a mindset that is focused on obeying His will and doing His will alone. He's not focusing on his own selfish agenda. He's focusing on what the Father has. Not only do we note a divine expectation, a sacrificial expression, and an intimate friendship, but finally I'd like you to note an outward evidence. Come back to the theme we've already stated, and I won't develop it. These things I command you, that you love one another. You are to have this kind of love for one another. Now the world is going to be a world of hostility and rejection, but that should not characterize our relationships here. May be that the Lord's challenged you in a particular relationship of yours that says, okay, this right here is not right. We're going to have a song of invitation here in just a few moments, and I want to encourage you to take that opportunity to consider your relationships with others. Be sure that they are truly what God would have for it to be. What kind of fruit does your life give evidence of? Does it indicate a person who is walking close to the Lord? Or does it indicate a person who's gotten away from the Lord? What kind of joy does, is characterized in your life? It's a challenge for us. Let's be sure that we have the right mindset on it. Let's pray and the musicians can come. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for your uh, many blessings to us. I thank you for uh, this text and, and just the opportunity we've had of being able to study it. And Lord, um, if you've placed certain areas uh, in our lives, you've identified certain areas in, I pray that we would be sensitive to those areas that we would seek to uh, f obey you and do that which you've called us to do. Uh, 
Uh, Lord, I pray for one who, if there are any who are unsaved, that this time would be uh, the time of their salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll sing a song of invitation, Ryan. Seven in our hymn books. Love divine, all loves itself. Thank you so much for joining us, and I uh, hope that it's been a help to you and a blessing. Challenge will be back tonight. We'll observe the Lord's Supper, and it will be in a different text as well, and not in our normal number study. And so I encourage you uh, to come with a heart that is ready for that. And uh, I did not mention this this morning. Uh, there are financial reports that are available on the back table. We are not going to observe the Lord's Supper and then finish that with a business meeting. That just seems to be totally contrary to things. Uh, the business meeting will conduct that next Sunday night, but uh, those financial reports are available. I believe they're now on this side, and uh, so if you would like to grab one, grab one. Look over that. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask those questions. Ryan, come closer. Just one more time. Pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the words we've heard, Lord. And Lord, no truths that, that we believe do not know that, Lord, it's just a constant reminder of how we must abide in you, Lord, and love like you, and love you. Lord, I pray that we always be restoring, refreshed, and have a renewed spirit in those, in those thoughts. Lord, I pray that uh, you give us a good rest of the day, that do your will, and bring us back safely to see. Lord, I ask these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Hope to see you tonight.